Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the Buster Show. This is actually episode 100 and a very special episode because we have paleontologist Harrison Duran in on the show. My friend, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. So first things first, you work with a company called Fossil Excavators. What, what, do you, what do you guys do? For those who are watching the video, you can sort of see a little bit of the action going on on the table behind you, but uh, what is it that you guys do? So we are a paleontology company specializing in the Hell Creek Formation of North Dakota. And the Hell Creek Formation is the late Cretaceous period right around 65 to 68 million years ago, which is right up to where the asteroid uh, wiped out the dinosaurs. And so we're a paleontology company uh, that uh, specializes in providing the opportunities to students, uh, the opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have with regards to getting field experience in paleontology. So that's excavating fossils, that's preparing them uh, and uh, so that's pretty much what we do is we excavate fossils in the field, we prospect for them and uh, remove them and prepare them back at our fossil lab here. And uh, so that's what you got going on behind me. And we have pretty much, this is kind of our sorting center where we work on stuff and molding it and making cast replicas and, and whatnot of the fossils. And uh, so yes, we are a paleontology company. So what are, the, what are the fossils you're working on now? So right now we are working on two triceratops skulls, which are in the workshop. Wow. And that's gonna be a really cool site once we get that up on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and everything. And, and uh, so we're working on two skulls. You could already check out one of the skulls that we have up on uh, TikTok that I've been working on. And so some of the fossils I have for you guys here is we made a mold of this one, found this last summer. And it's a subadult triceratops horn. Is that real? Yeah, so this is the real horn. Wow. The triceratops. Uh, and it's a, it's a subadult because the horns get a lot larger than this. Uh, and it's a, it's a really cool piece. And, you know, the unique part was that it was actually sitting right on top of the ground. No uh, way. Yeah, just, That's just pretty rare, horn. right? Yeah, with other fragments, and uh, so you don't usually find that. So it was a really cool find that we had, and we were taking some folks out uh, touring and, and showing them around and how to prospect, and then one of them stumbled across this. So Now, obviously, that, that didn't look like that when it was on top of the ground. What did it look like? Well, it, it, uh, it for the most part, had sediment on top of it, so it had sand. Uh, usually what we come across, what it's embedded in is uh, shale, so it's like a, it's like a hardened clay. Uh, so that's just so shale is pretty much what clay turns into over time. And so had 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 shale uh, around the base of it, it had sand on it. So we sandblasted a lot of that off and uh, we dip it in a liquid glue to give it a nice, you know, solid uh, hardened seal to it. And uh, and and this is the this is the finished product. So. Yeah, this is it. Wow. Right here. Now, how how much? Uh, what was the bone density of this Triceratops skull? How much of it did you guys find? So right now we have this. We have different. We have like five or so other pieces that would fit on the base of this horn. So this is starting to kind of uh, widen out, right? So this is kind of part of the skull now. So what you'll find is you'll find other pieces, and eventually you'll find the eye right below the horn here, if you have all the pieces there. Uh, and so we found uh, some frill pieces. We found part of the occipital condyle, which is a ball joint. Essentially, it's the part of the skull that attaches to the neck. Uh, so we have that, that part, and um, it's still going into this, uh, that one dig site where we found this. So we still have to return probably next uh, dig season when the, when the weather clears up here in North Dakota is when we'll head out to, to that dig site. And uh, so we're excited to see what else we could we could find there. What what is the average? Uh, you know, when you come upon something like that, let's say that's the first thing you find. What, what are the averages in terms of how much of that skull or of that dinosaur you can expect to find? Yeah, so it would depend on the species, but 
most of the time you're finding fragments. You're finding bits and pieces. You don't find complete skeletons like in the movies. Uh, in Jurassic <laughs> Park, right. one of the first scenes, they're digging up this like fully articulated raptor yeah. skeleton. <laughs> And uh, that would be like huge news. In the movie, they're all upset. They're like, well, we barely find anything. But that's like, that would have been like the, one of the greatest finds ever to actually find an articulated uh, raptor skeleton like right, that. But, right. but uh, so, so it gives you an idea that it's not like that all the time. Uh, you, you, you can occasionally find articulated skeletons, uh, but that, uh, that's, that's uh, very rare. It's, it depends on the type of... Uh, uh, formation that you're digging in, the type of rock formation. In China, they'll find smaller uh, species. So you'll find turtles, lizards, birds, smaller raptors, mammals even, where the entire skeleton is there. But it's like a small animal, right? And it's embedded in clay. So you have these sheets of clay and sandstone that you kind of chisel apart like these, these, these plates Right. And, uh, and that's where you have an articulated, complete skeleton. And that's usually of a smaller animal. It's not like you find a, you know, a, a 4,000 pound uh, predator or, you know, uh, a larger dinosaur of larger size, 20,000 pound T-Rex. You never find that. You, you rarely would find that uh, fully articulated. They're usually spread out and washed out. And that's a lot of what we find is just washed out sediments. So this would be in like a river system. So they would die in a river and then they would, their bodies would be scavenged by crocodiles or other dinosaurs. And then their, their bones are just kind of washed out and spread out. And that's usually what we find in, in our sediments. So where are the best places to find the larger predators and 4,000 pound dinosaurs like yeah. you're talking about? Is there a specific place on planet earth where you can, you can expect to, or have the best chance of finding that kind of stuff? So there are different specific rock formations and places that are of different time periods of the earth. So for the Jurassic, you would go to the Morrison formation. And that's where you find Allosaurus and Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus and uh, Brachiosaurus too, are, are the Jurassic uh, dinosaurs. And uh, for the for T-Rex and Triceratops, you find in the Hell Creek formation. So that spans across Montana, North and South Dakota, and Wyoming. Uh, and you also have different Cretaceous rock formations up in Canada, too. There have been T-Rexes and Triceratopses there, and Edmontosaurus, that's found in Edmonton, Canada. That's what it's named after. Uh, Edmontosaurus, we find tons of Edmontosaurus here. In fact, this is an Edmontosaurus uh, metacarpal, so they'd be like a hand bone. This would just be one of the three hand bones in a wow. Edmontosaurus here. So that, that's, that's that. This that's is washed out. Hand. Yeah. And as you can <laughs> tell, the dark part is the more, uh, it's the more well-preserved part. And this part was exposed to the, 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 the elements was being eroded. Right, so you can her. tell of how quickly a fossil can erode once it's exposed. So the best places in the world to kind of answer the question is it varies. Uh, South America is where you find the titanosaurs. So these are the these are the large these are the largest uh, long neck sauropod uh, uh, plant eating dinosaurs that you find are in uh, Argentina have been like the largest like the top three largest species ever found have been in Argentina. Wow. Now I, I, I have so many questions for you, but the one I want to ask now is you know there's so many misnomers for the specimens in museums, right? Mm -hmm. Most people think that everything they're looking at is 100% dinosaur, you know, it's, mm -hmm. they dug and then they found that, you know, like you were saying, most people don't really know, you know, that you usually just find tiny fragments and then you have to, right. out to put that together. And I know, you know, for a lot of the specimens that set record breaking prices, like T-Rexes that will sell in auction to museums or celebrities or whoever, um, you know, they're combinations of multiple specimens, right? So right. how how much of what you see in museums do you think is real? And are oftentimes a lot of the dinosaurs on display just straight up casts? 
It would depend on the museum, but a lot of the times you are looking at a partial skeleton. So you're looking at uh, real elements of the skeleton, real dinosaur bone, which are then uh, completed with uh, the cast. So we would call that a composite. It's a composite of real and uh, plaster or polymer uh, resin uh, molds. And one example would be, this is a triceratops horn. So this is the nose horn. This is like the front, the front uh, of, of the, uh, the face, right? The nose horn, the beak would be right here. You keep going along back here, you have the eye, you know, and the brow horns. So this is a real triceratops horn. The tip has some completed uh, clay or some completed, we would call this more of a, a paleo bond uh, a paleo bond uh, putty. It's like a resin putty. So it's it's two elements. It's it's a mixture of two putties. You roll them up, you mold it, and then they harden. They they rock harden, and uh, that's what you do to complete other side. So I mean, the most of this is complete, but th let's say right. you know the tip is right. I mean, so, that's one percent of it, right? Right. And so, and then this would need to have some sort of restoration if we don't find more at the site. So this is a femur. This is the end of a femur of a theropod. So that would be a, a uh, they're typically, the, those are the, the meat eating, the predatory dinosaurs like raptors and T-Rexes or theropods. Uh, some were omnivores too, like oviraptors could have been omnivores. Uh, so this could either belong to a juvenile T-Rex or oh. a uh, Anzu wileyi, which is a, um, it's kind of like an oviraptor uh, looking thing. I think it was in, when it was first discovered, it was deemed the hell chicken. So it's like this mass the hell chicken. That's a bird like dinosaur. It would have been really kind of scary to encounter, but this is like the femur. So for instance, this is real. The rest of it would be, you know, a completed composite. So to kind of answer the, your question is that in museums, a lot of the time, some of the times you do come across the real uh, di specimens. Uh, you do come across uh, fairly completed, and we're talking eighty percent complete, and which is great. Which is great. Yeah, that's and that's and that's fabulous for selling. So the so the the monetary side of it is that uh, you you could get more for a more completed specimen. Of course. Yeah, that's super interesting. So now yeah. for for that bone, for example, if that's a T Rex. You know, obviously, it's worth significantly more than if right. it's the hell chicken. Yeah. Um, you know, so how do you go about figuring out what that is? So you would. It's pretty much when you're when you're digging up, uh, when you're digging up fossils. Paleontology is essentially collecting data. It's collecting all available data from the site that would that would lead to all, any information, the most information possible to come to a conclusion. And for finding out what this is, we have plenty of, um, I shouldn't say plenty, but we have several specimens from Anzu and from, uh, from you know, juvenile T-Rexes, not that many juvenile T-Rexes found, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, how you would go about figuring this out would be little bits in detail. You would have this little, uh, these protrusion, this protrusion on the uh, femur could be, could be a uh, indication, the angle right. of which the femur is going, the, the indentation of this socket, the, the, how big the uh, process is that goes into the hip. So this would go, this part right here, this rounded part would go into the fit right. the hip of the animal. And from there, we would figure out what it is. One thing we could tell is that they had hollow bones. You can see that's a hollow bone in there. That's crazy. Just like birds today. So birds are descended from theropod dinosaurs. Is, is that how scientists and paleontologists figured that out? Because of the hollow bone uh, comparison? Yes, you'd figure out that then that uh, that's one of the things that, that we figured out that uh, can conclude that birds birds today are the last living dinosaurs. So a bird is a dinosaur. It's not just a descendant of a dinosaur, it is a dinosaur. The same way a blue whale and a mouse are both mammals. So dinosauria right. is just a broader 
uh, it's a broader clade, it's a broader group of uh, reptilians uh, that uh, a myriad of different species fall under. So the last, we actually call birds avian dinosaurs in science. That's what we call them. And we call T-Rex and Triceratops, all the old ones, non-avian dinosaurs. So birds are actually classified as dinosaurs. So how scientists would go about that is yes, looking at the hollow bone, we could conclude there's some sort of relation there. There's an evolutionary ancestral relation between birds and theropod dinosaurs. Wow, that's super interesting. Now, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the color of dinosaurs, I remember hearing probably like five or 10 years ago that there was a discovery of a bone with a little bit of pigment on it. What, what do you know about what, what, you know, everybody in the community knows about the color of dinosaurs? Were they colored similar to birds? Like were there bright pink, you know, T-Rexes? What, what do we know? We know from several specimens, we could actually tell what color they were. So from certain specimens, the one I mentioned before in, uh, in Asia, the reason why China is big is that China has lots of clay deposits. In clay, you could even have your, you could be mummified in a sense. You could be slightly mummified to where you have, uh, where we could, we're looking under certain uh, spectroscopy, like certain microscopes, uh, and certain, uh, you know, devices, you can actually take it to more of like a, a, a laser. I'm trying to think of the right term. I don't want to botch this, but it, it's sort of a, um, it's sort of a, uh, you could take it to a lab that uses lasers to, you know, use some sort of uh, uh, microscope technology to analyze the fossil and the microscopic detail. And sometimes you're actually able to look at the pigmentation that has been preserved in the fossil and from the shape of the different pigments or the, the 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 shape of the different color pigments we'd be able to tell us what color it was right so we could t so some raptors we've actually been able to tell that they were orange like a uh whoa yeah like a, i wasn't uh, even expecting that they're not orange in the movies yes <laughs> and so it was it was orange with black and white stripes like a ringtail lemur so an orange Jeez. body. So they were probably very colorful. If they had feathers, they were probably quite colorful, just like birds. Now, if you look in nature, elephants and rhinos are not uh, really colorful. Lions are not, you know, neon pink because they need to blend it into their surroundings. Right. Tigers are a little bit different, but tiger camouflage makes sense. The stripes camouflage them in the brush and the trees and the forest. Uh, so we can actually look at animals today and think, well, dinosaurs probably had uh, similar coloring, like similar coloring schemes to what you would expect, like a, right. uh, a group of Edmontosaurs, um, for instance, one of the Edmontosaurus, mu Edmontosaurus mummies called Dakota, it was found by Tyler Leeson, who's a paleontologist, I believe, at, the, at a museum in Colorado, it might be the Denver Museum. And, uh, and he found that, that mummy when he was about like my age or a little younger, I'm 25. So he found that like bef either when he was an undergrad or something, but, wow. uh, but basically this mummy was able to, we were able to see not the, really the specific color, but the coloration as far as the pattern. So it had more of this spotted body with a striped tail. That's it was really so, and it makes sense because a herd of them would confuse a T-Rex, let's say, if right, a bird of right. them work together, just like zebra stripes are used to confuse a lion. So it doesn't camouflage it, but it confuses the lion as to which is an individual zebra. So right. you could see a T-Rex lurking out of the out of the tree line, looking at a bunch of admonosaurs grazing on some grass, and their camouflage would help them sort of uh, confuse the predators as to which was an individual of Montessor. So you, to, for the coloration, we know from a few different specimens that they had interesting coloration. So Cetacosaurus is another one where we have the complete body and the skin and the colors uh, preserved. In the, the skin. 
Yeah, so it's the skin. It's a mummy. It's a, exquisite specimens. There's actually like 80 of them covered in a landslide. It's kind of sad. Really? But yeah, so it's a whole herd of them. Yeah, that I feel covered. like after 50 million years, it's no longer sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it is, it's a, yeah, it's a sad little story when you think about it, but then so much time has passed where it's you're thankful that we have this information about them. <laughs> totally. Yeah, you know, it, and it's really cool. It's, it's a really cool... Um, uh, site, I believe it's in Asia and somewhere in Asia, I should know the exact location, but, uh, essentially like a bunch of them were covered in a landslide in some sort of clay, sandy landslide. And a lot of their bodies were preserved. I mean, we're talking skin and then we could actually like that, that laser technique I mentioned earlier, right. You're able to actually see the, uh, the different pigmentation of them. So we actually know what their entire body was colored like, and it was beige and white and like a white underbelly with more of a reddish brownish top. Uh, they had quills on their tails, like a weird little quill thing, like a porcupine on their tails. Uh, and, uh, and so they were, they were colored pretty much how you would expect them. I mean, nothing too wild, but, you know, they had different color patterns. And uh, so we could actually make these predictions about what dinosaurs were colored like. We could either have a well-preserved mummy where we're able to analyze the pigmentation, or you could make predictions as to what an animal would look like if it grazed on grass. You know, we look at animals today, right? Uh, Cape buffalo, wildebeest, bison, they have pretty much... Uh, pretty bland, you know, right? Yeah. And, and so, but then you look at zebras, right? So then you could have, you could have different stripe patterns. And right. Stuff. It depends who's, who's being hunted and who's hunting. Right. Yeah. And what it, depending on a, on a Rex, now a Rex lived in forests. So would a Rex be striped? Would it be, it probably wouldn't be neon pink because it would stick out. So it kind of needs to camouflage a little bit uh, is, is what some of the predictions would be. That would be pretty crazy if it was like an army camo color. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it would be pretty wild. It's cool to 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 predict that, and I hope someday we would have to find a well-preserved Rex mummy to the point of where maybe we can answer that question. Wow. Now you mentioned feathers potentially being on a on a raptor, since they are descendants uh, or birds are descendants of them. Is it not a guarantee that they all had feathers? Because, you know, as they're depicted in every children's book, movie, et cetera, none of them have feathers. Right. Um, so where where is the discrepancy there? So that anything like you had any depiction of raptors, raptors were first found in like the 60s. I think Deinonychus was the first raptor that was found uh, somewhere in Utah. And that was in like the 60s, first described one. And the, the depiction, as far as we knew at that time, all throughout those decades, uh, was that raptors uh, were pretty much like other dinosaurs that had scales. And as it turns out, you know, as from the more evidence that we have, and like I mentioned before, the specimens that are embedded in clay where we could see their soft tissue, and we actually find fuzzy filaments around the body preserved in the really? clay showing that they had plumage like a bird so wow. and and even in their bones and raptor bones in the forearm right here uh in either radius or ulna you have uh you have quill holes so bo raptor bones and bird bones as well they'll have quill holes uh where where quills came out of the arm so so raptors were feathered uh now how much feathering is uh, up to debate um, but it was probably at the very least a basic a plumage like a uh, like like a uh, uh, an emu or an ostrich or a cassowary. But has they don't really have flight feathers? They have more right. display feathers. Well, ostriches use their feathers to steer when they're running. Raptors could have done that too. Uh, they could have had that's uh, an interesting thought. Yeah, and uh, so so they also when raptors have those killing claws on their toes. They could have been on an animal and been balancing as they were on top of it on its back or something. And so there's different hypotheses as to how they use their feathers. But yes, theropods, uh, most likely, as far as raptors or the raptora, they had 
uh, they had feathers of some sort, some sort of plumage. And yeah, so there's been other species like U. tyrannus in China. It's like a 25, 30 foot long tyrannosaur cousin. It's a cousin of T-Rex. And it was covered in a fuzzy plumage. So now that's a bigger dinosaur covered in some sort of fuzz, but it was probably living in a colder environment. So, so that had yeah. something to do with the weather, right? Yeah, it has to do with uh, the the uh, it has to do with the, the temperature and the environment too, because a larger animal is trying to lose body heat, and so that's why you don't see African elephants with fur. Asian mm -hmm. elephants sometimes have a little fur on their back, but pretty much right. furless. Now, a woolly mammoth does have fur because it lived in a colder environment. So a larger animal, a larger dinosaur, at least a predatory dinosaur could have had some sort of plumage, but a T-Rex wouldn't have had plumage because it was in a warm environment. Uh, so it all depends on, you know, the, again. Right. The now, I, from what I've seen, DNA can't last for more than 800,000-ish years, mm -hmm. maybe a million, but I don't yeah. think any have been found. So is there any chance that dinosaur DNA could be discovered if it was kept in the most perfect immaculate location that you that like a scientist could make 200 million years ago or is it you know against all science that that's possible it is it is absolutely gone from time there is absolutely no dinosaur or non-avian dinosaur DNA. It's, I know, sorry to crush the hopes of the folks back home and the audience, but, uh, and yourself and myself uh, uh, and many let me, other let me, let me just, let me throw this at you first. Okay. Technically, if you're 300 million light years away right now and you look at Earth, you see dinosaurs. If there were a telescope that strong. Right. So, just need to figure out how to travel fast. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In, in reverse time too. That could be, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the, yeah. The, uh, uh, yeah. That's kind of a cool thing. If, yeah, if you were like 60, 70 million light years away and you're able to look at, look at the light and focus it. Uh, yes. You would be able, like really? Andromeda galaxy is like 65 million light years away. Exactly. Yeah. Just kind of funny. And so if you were there right now, you'd be looking at earth and you would, you know, you'd be seen. Right. You'd well, you're, you know. you're 25, you're 25, light years away you could see yourself being born in theory yeah exactly theory. it's, it's, it's kinda, a pretty it's, crazy concept but yes it's, but yeah it's i mean true. It's, you have no you know you you have no um dna in this stuff i mean it is just it's just purely rock it's purely sediment it's replaced the bone and all the cells and all the material of the bone has been replaced uh, by sediment over time it's been fossilized so there is no um, biological material, with the exception of uh, some organic molecules, some uh, proteins that have been altered in a way. Uh, that's similar to the proteins that were found in the soil on Mars. I don't know if you heard that on the news, but they found organic molecules on Mars in the soil. And those are just molecules that are, you know, residual that are left over in the soil. And those could last. But as far as like a cell, a DNA, right. stuff like that, it's, it's totally gone. The oldest that I believe DNA has been found was first a horse, and that was discovered by, I believe that was Beth Shapiro. That, that, that was like 800,000 years, right? 800,000 years old. I think there's also a mammoth that was found that could have been uh, even older. I would have to check on that. I think that was a recent paper that just came out. Uh, but as far as a, so the hypothetical, so this has actually been done. This has been calculated. If you have a hypothetical machine, that controlled temperature, it was airtight vacuum sealed, uh, and it had DNA, the longest DNA could possibly last would be 6 million years in the most perfect condition, let alone 65 million years. And, and that's because, you know, we have proteins or enzymes that repair our DNA because our DNA breaks down naturally, regardless, it just starts, breaks down our body but we have proteins to fix this. And this happens trillions of times in your body just with proteins fixing DNA and stuff. And then when you pass, uh, the proteins stop and the proteins stop uh, repairing DNA. So your DNA just degrades. And it takes so 6 million years to degrade. If you were to have it in the most perfect conditions, 
if you have it in this frozen airtight seal temperature controlled device, let's say hypothetically, the longest the DNA could last would be like 6 million years and let alone left out in the rain for 65 million years, you know? Right. So, yeah. So unfortunately there is no um, way to, to bring back dinosaurs in that sense, but there is kind of another, another way you could, you could do it in, in theory. What uh, is that other way? So, so the, the other way you could do it is reverse engineer birds and give them tails, claws. Now. Yeah. That would be insane. I've never yeah. thought about that. <laughs> yeah. So you could actually reverse actively, evolution. Yes. Um, so I don't know if you saw on like Ripley's Believe It or Not, but like there were twins in Mexico that were part of the circus and they had that mutation where they're fully covered in fur. And uh and there's been several yeah there have been several other people across history that have had that mutation unfortunately they're subjected to quote you know freak shows and circuses right. uh, at the time you know people weren't able to process you know things like that so that's what people were subjected to if they had that kind of mutation um uh but uh so yeah that mutation is an atavism activation and basically that's an ancestral gene that has been turned on and you have ancestral genes within your, your DNA that could be turned on in theory. So when humans are developing in the womb, at some point uh, you actually, as a fetus, you have gills at, at a certain point in your development, then they go away and then you actually have a tail like a monkey, like a, like an ape, like a, like a primate rather. And then that eventually recedes away as you develop more into a human. Uh, Is now that, that's from our tail bone. Yes, exactly. And that's some people great. are born with it too. You could look it up. Some people I've, are actually I've, born with I've a little. I've seen that actually. Yeah. yeah. And uh, snakes are sometimes born with with legs. Dolphins have been born with rear legs. Uh, so you have these atavism activations that happen from time to time. Now with a chicken or a bird, a cassowary or an ostrich or any bird, at some point in their development, they have a three fingered claw and they have a snout and they have teeth sometimes in their embryonic development and they have a tail. Now, if you were to prevent those things from receding and going away and having the bird develop into a regular bird, you could have something born with a three finger claw, uh, a tail and uh, a snout instead of a beak and teeth. And then essentially- you dinosaur. Have, <laughs> you have dinosaur, yeah, yeah. So that's oh, one way you could do that. Um, Hans Larsen and uh, Jack Horner, or at least the last I heard were the ones that were working on uh, that project. I think it hasn't received enough funding. Like if you received enough funding, we could just do it pretty easily, but uh, people just haven't like gone and done it yet. Uh, as far as like- How much does something like that cost? It, I mean, it, it's pretty much just the research. Like if you find, if you figure out the genes, then it's just a few chemicals that you subject an embryo to. And then like you have a chicken or a chicanosaurus that's born uh, a little- Giant hell chicken. chicken. <laughs> I would definitely want one too. I would want a dino chicken. I'd have a whole flock of dino chickens. <laughs> but uh, oh my God. Um, yeah, it wouldn't really be that much cost. Pretty much just the manpower and hours to, to do something like that. Uh, and some, you know, you know, uh, gene editing equipment, but, uh, and, and a lab, but different people have like worked on it. Like a guy in Harvard, he actually got the beak to become a snout and, but he didn't hatch the chickens just out of like ethical thing. Like he just did an experiment to, with the embryos and then he gave them snouts like an alligator or a raptor. So kind of pretty, pretty wild. Uh, uh, yeah. Thing. Why, why get DNA when you can just do it that way? Yeah, exactly. You could just design design anything. It's pretty much like a build a bear shop for for, oh for genetics. God. What are the legalities around doing that to animals? I think that pretty much, you know, the kind of stuff we subject mice and primates to for clinical trials. We can do uh, that for like chickens that you yeah. know, fast food companies probably treat worse. Yeah, right, exactly. And I don't really ethically, I don't really see anything wrong with it considering that, yeah, I mean, you have chickens and mass, you know, uh, mass production farming, right. That, that are subjected to terrible lives. down and fed. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, if you just give a chicken some hands and a tail and have it chilling in the backyard, I don't know. It, just, it, it yeah. wouldn't know. It wouldn't know. Yeah. And it would be, an, I, I think personally, it would be an interesting experiment. Um, of course, there's, you know, ethical concerns with that. But if you're editing birds and we already subject primates and mice to terrible conditions in labs anyway, so uh, I think it would be a really cool experiment. Yeah, the only the only fear is, you know, the Jurassic Park fear where, you know, you create some stuff that's, you know, yeah, than what we can what we're ready to handle. Yeah, you could have if you did that to like an ostrich or a cassowary. So cassowaries are those Australian uh, big birds. They could get up to six feet tall and uh, they have that killing claw toe on their. They're actually the only recorded bird to have caused a mortality. So they're the only recorded bird in history to have like to have actually killed somebody on like re- like police records and stuff. It's done it in Australia. They've done it to like a few kids, I think, and maybe an adult man, but they basically kick with the like a raptor. They kick with, with their a knife. With yeah, pretty much it's like a six inch uh their toe is just like a steak, you know. So it's like it's that's a pretty dangerous animal. So if you were to make that into a raptor and make it even more dangerous that could that could be you could run into some problems there but yeah Jeez, man yeah yeah it's it's crazy. crazy concepts you you want all this to happen i mean i kind of do too. Yeah. yeah i would i mean build high enough fences and make sure your power doesn't go out and any that's what they said in jurassic park too that's right yeah <laughs> <laughs> but then that's that's sort of the the uh the moral of the story of jurassic park is chaos theory so you would have, uh, you would have, you know, you think you have everything under control, but some random thing happens that you weren't, pre- you weren't uh, predicting. Right. And uh, so chaos theory is pretty much that uh, it's kind of like Murphy's law, you know, anything that can happen will happen. And uh, you could always have things out of your control. And the main moral of that is illusion, the, the illusion of control. You think you have it under control, but it's merely an illusion because you're still subjected to uh, all the chaos. You're, that you're aware of what you know. Yeah. yeah. Boy, that's yeah. really interesting. Um, I want to get back to that, but I wanted to ask you too, you know, the secondary market for dinosaurs has been, you know, just continuously growing over the last 20, 30 years, probably in part to all these movies. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the most are, is it true that the most valuable dinosaurs are all those who are whom are featured in the most movies, like the T-Rex, who isn't the biggest predator we know of, right? That's, you know, the holy grail of dinosaur, you know, full skeleton collecting. Yes. Um, and Triceratops too, and raptors, okay. but these are just the stars in the movies, right? There's nothing... Yeah that special relative to the other dinosaurs their size and at their time you know i would actually say that the rex and the triceratops are although they were kind of, since they're found in north america you have not just the film but not just jurassic park but all of literature and like stop motion films and up until that point you know t-rex and triceratops are the quintessential uh, two dinosaurs, you know, dueling it out. It's like the most epic battle in history that we have been kind of taught. Uh, that that, and as far as ceratopsians go, triceratops is actually yeah one of the biggest. I mean, you have okay. other, you have pentaceratops and torosaurus, which have longer uh, frill pieces in the back of their head, so they technically have the larger skulls. But a triceratops is kind of one of the more robustly built. And as we're talking about weight it's probably the biggest same thing with t-rex like so spinosaurus is longer but it's not as heavy or not as built as a as a fully grown t-rex or giganotosaurus too which is the other the south american one which is technically longer and technically has a slightly longer skull t-rex still had a more powerful bite i think a t-rex would probably body a a giganotosaurus if the full grown two of them went face to face same thing with a with a spinosaurus too. A spinosaurus is more of like a aquatic based river dwelling uh, species. I mean, it had pretty nasty claws too. So I think it could do some damage with the claws, but it's, it's, you know, it's snout and it's, uh, it, 
and its you know neck and and everything about its anatomy that way is kind of more geared towards fish. So I'd say, but yes, it's like the movies do. Um, the movies do uh, like add more to the value. Uh, the, the pop culture, the the icons, the all that does add to the value and has jumped up the the uh, the cost of of dinosaurs and. It, I guess it's kind of like to kind of get to more of the financial side of it. It's, it's sort of uh, the, the rarity of the fossil and uh, the completion, like how, how completed is the fossil and, uh, and the icon status, the popularity status is what adds to uh, the value for sure. That makes sense. Now, what are, what are the most valuable dinosaur fossils ever found do you know like some of the top yeah. record sales and why they sold for what they sold for yeah so that would be uh so that would be stan was the first was the was the most expensive one ever sold so that was 31.8 million dollars was San, stan just sold for a uh for a uh, pretty much to settle a lawsuit between two brothers, Pete and Neil Larson. They had a falling out. They used, they ran the Black Hills Institute. There's a lot of interesting paleo drama too we could get to, but. Um, so curious now, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, so 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 Stan, the T-Rex was found in, I don't know, like 1996 or something around that time, maybe a little bit after. And uh, Stan has the most completed T-Rex skull ever. The body, Sue has the most completed body ever of any T-Rex, uh, but Stan's skull is the most complete and Stan is still like a 95% complete. I think Sue was 98% complete, you know, so body, just barely. Right. Um, and so, so, St so Pete and Neil Larson had some sort of falling out. I won't speak on their behalf or anything uh, publicly, <laughs> but from what is the, to gather pretty much the national news now because of the sale, was that they had some sort of falling out and to settle um, Neil Larson's uh, equity in the company, the Black Hills Institute, which is a museum in Hill City, South Dakota. Uh, I believe they, the judge at least uh, ruled that uh, the selling of the T-Rex skeleton would, would be a, a fair uh, selling off as opposed to breaking up the entire institute and all of its collections and fossils, breaking that in half it would be better to just sell the T-Rex and give that to the brother. Uh, and so when that was sold, I think it was estimated to sell at around $6 million. And that would be a fair sell-off since the entire Black Hills Institute was valued at around $6 million for all of its collections, all of its fossils. But it ended up selling for $31.8 million. So uh, one of the brothers was able to you know, walk away with that, that money. There were other people involved too. So it wasn't like he got all the 31.8 million. There was different uh, partners. So that was kind of taxes got half taxes. <laughs> so, yep, taxes. And uh, so, so uh, the uh, uncle Sam got a little chunk, somebody else got a little chunk, you know, the lawyers involved got a chunk and, and with the whole lawsuit. So it was pretty much picked apart like a carcass, you know, all the hyenas came in and, all the raptors came in and tore it apart, but, <laughs> that's, that's but uh, yeah, so there is kind of a curse with the T-Rex. There is a curse with it, and I believe the curse is real, where somebody always gets screwed in a T-Rex deal. If you have the king, you got to pay a price. So with Rexes that have been found, Victoria is the other T-Rex that's in Canada. It's been going on display uh, on like a world tour kind of thing uh, picking it up and moving it from place to place yeah yeah so they have like a traveling exhibit it's a really cool exhibit if you if anyone listening in if you want to go see it if it's near you um That's it would be cool. a cool exhibit to see i still haven't seen it yet but you could see it on youtube and stuff too but um uh so victoria was actually uh is actually in a lawsuit with the landowners and the uh the other guy who uh found it um and he's actually featured on Dino Hunters. So they talk about the lawsuit on the Discovery Channel show, Dino Hunters. I think season two is airing right now. Um, 
but uh, so there's a lawsuit there between the uh, landowners and uh, and this uh, and the other guy that was uh, wanting to wanting to find it or wanting to, or who, who found it. He's you know I, I believe there's a dispute over the percentage of who gets what right of the wrecks, and uh, so uh, so there's always and again Sue Dinosaur Thirteen the documentary is really good it tells you about the whole colossal you know, mess that Sue was, right? Sue was found by the Black Hills Institute, the same guys that found Stan. Uh, so Pete Larson got screwed over again. <laughs> um, and uh, he basically, they, Sue Hendrickson stumbled across the skeleton and then she called the rest of the crew over and then everybody excavates uh, uh, Sue, the T-Rex. They paid the landowner $5,000, they shook hands, and then uh, they were gonna have it in their museum. They were gonna sell it for a giant amount. They were just gonna have it in their museum for people to come in and look. And all of a sudden, the US government with guns drawn, M16s and everything, showed up and repossessed the, the T-Rex. And- Why? Because it was found on government land. Well, okay, so this That's is kind of- That's right. They found it on a rancher's land, Maurice Williams. Maurice Williams bought that land from the uh, local tribe, the reservation. It was on the reservation. Oh, no. So the tribe's like, that's our T-Rex, right? And the landowner's like, well, no, it's mine. And the tribe's like, well, it's still our reservation, so whatever say goes, right? And then the U.S. government was like, well, tribe, hold on. We gave that to you in perpetuity back in 1870, whatever. And uh, so now we're going to repos repossess it. It was basically the the tribe, and and forgive me for anyone who's part of the tribe. Showed up to the museum with like guns drawn or what? Yeah, like U.S. Marshals. Uh, I believe it was like National Guard too. Like, like uh, that I forgot. It was so uh, unnecessary. The T Rex yeah. isn't going to fight back. Yeah, it was. It was so. It was totally ridiculous. It was a total clown show. It was tried to like this flex by. I forget if it's the state marshals or FBI, but it was the government that came in, the feds. Uh, came in and uh, and and pretty much repossessed it. And it, you could watch the video. Like there's guys, you know, walking in with the M16. I'm gonna look that up right after. That's it crazy. was. It was so. If you want to look it up, watch Dinosaur 13 before you look up it. Like watch, you find that it's a okay. really good documentary. I encourage anybody to watch it. And uh, so so there's with the point being is that with T Rexes, from the monetary side of things, there's always a some big lawsuit with uh with t-rexes if they're going to be sold privately because people and the landowners how many t-rexes are there there have been at least up until that point when sue was found in 1993 uh that was the 13th t-rex found at least by the black hills and so very Institute. very few yeah i think now it's it's maybe over 30 partial skeletons so a partial skeleton is like 30% and above. That's like the, that's the, the complete, that's the ruling on as far as if you can consider it a partial skeleton to be 30% complete and above. And the, so, but with, with as far as, you know, really good, like 60% and above T-Rexes and maybe like five or six, like I think 80% and above, 80% like above, it would be like five or six. That would be Victoria, Stan, Sue, uh, Titus, who's on display in England right now. Um, and I should be thinking about, let me, a few others that are Scotty. That's another one. So that's, that's the biggest one by weight that is projected to be the heaviest T-Rex wow. ever. So Scotty is on display in Canada at the Royal Tyrell Museum. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, so there's like a handful of now, like 80% complete t -rexes. How many more do you think are out there? Hundreds, thousands? There was a paper that was out that just came out that projected how many T-Rexes ever existed. And they figured, okay, if a T-Rex needs 40 square uh, kilometers uh, to live, you know, to roam, uh, and if you would project that out and project out the 40 square kilometers to the land mass, there's probably about 20,000 T-Rexes that were alive in North America running okay. around and eating. 
um, at, at a given time. So if you'd go back in right, right, time, right. Right. So you'd flying around the Cretaceous, yeah. you'd count about 20,000 it would be around. Uh, and, and it could be more. I mean, this was just a basic ecological projection. Right. Now, if you're, you're wrong about everything anyways. Right, yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> if, if you were to measure out where T-Rex existed from 68 or 67 to 65 million years, 65 and a half million years, then you can't 40 20 thousand t-rexes at a given time they lived at least like 30 years lived to be about 30 years old um you'd count about 2 billion t-rexes existed over the time of you said how many like about 2 billion t-rexes existed between 67 and 65 and a half million years right so if you project that out, then there could be conceivably at the very minimum hundreds of well-preserved T-Rexes to thousands um, that are still left to be unearthed. Now, easier said than done. If everybody could go out and find a T-Rex for $30 million or more, then everybody would be doing it. But you don't find them. Like you, you, you don't find an 80, 90% complete T-Rex. Like, that doesn't always happen. It rarely happens. It's only happened six times or whatever in the last 150 years. So you're not going to, you're not going to come across something like that uh, unless you're looking for it. Um, so, so how many are preserved? It could be conceivably thousands that are still buried. Uh, but every, every bone that you find, um, not to go on a long tangent here, but but everything that you find uh, is fragments of bone that are spilling out of the hillside that are eroding away in a in a in a canyon, right? So you find bones that are you know spilling out that are eroding. That's how you could tell that there's possibly more bone underneath, and then that's how you excavate. That's where you dig. So when you're prospecting, you're looking for fragments of bone that are spilling out of the, the buttes or canyons, and uh, the essentially the um you know like it's it's difficult to find something it's difficult to find uh, a complete skeleton based off of that so if the only part where we could find dinosaurs is the eroding pieces that means that underneath the ground deeper into these hills there could be you know complete skeletons that are still waiting 50 feet deep into the you know into the earth that are still waiting to be right uh, uncovered it's just really expensive also to excavate that and not find it yes that's the gamble more likely outcome that is the gamble you spend the money and the manpower and the time to excavate something and you don't find anything you may find a couple bones so that's that's what makes it you know that's what makes it costly yeah it is like a real gamble right yeah and you know think about even if you do find it it can cost a lot of money to get it out yes hey everybody who's helping you and then you could run into conflict on top of that like imagine if you do all that and then you know the government says it's theirs right so they're all oh yeah all yeah other things as well how do you know what's yours and what's not or is it like only if it's a 20 million dollar item do so you yeah. sign contracts with the landowner beforehand uh, before you so, even look yeah just to look so you sign a contract with the landowner you say all right uh this is granting permission for us to go on the land and this is a contract that says anything that is found and sold uh we get 90 percent and you get 10 that's the industry standard is 90 to 10 tree bold paleontology i believe that's what the that's what their standard is like 90 10 they could negotiate a little bit more um, for oil companies, to put in perspective, for an oil company, the industry standard is 24%. Some landowners could argue uh, higher, like um, 30%. Um, that's because you're constantly finding oil. So if I'm constantly pumping money out of the ground, and it's like an insured thing, basically, when you sell up an oil derrick, like you get right. money, you're pumping oil out of the, and so I'm, I'll give you 30%. I'll give you 25% because I'm making so much money. So landowner, but finding a fossil, we may not even find anything. 
we, we were spending time going out excavating prospecting and then we have to extract it, bring in heavy machinery, if it's a bigger thing, and then the preparation time in the lab. So you get 10% because you're not doing anything and there's no guarantee for me to find anything. So it's like 80 to 90% is pretty much what you want to negotiate uh, when you're uh, a fossil hunter. So if you're, if you're um, signing the contract, that's pretty much the, the, the evaluation that you're, you're giving because you're, it's not like an oil company where you're guaranteed to pump liquid gold out of the, out of the ground. Uh, right. So the fact that you may not find something and waste time. It's all factored into that rate, right? Right. And some landowners don't get it. Some landowners will be like 50%. And then you just like laugh and walk away. Because that's just like ridiculous. Exactly. I'm like, no, you don't, you don't understand how this works. Uh, so, yeah. So that's kind of a reality that you need to install landowners if they can't agree and they just walk away. I mean, some people, some companies will walk away if they don't even agree to 10. It's 10, take it or leave it. 10%, take it or leave it, you know. And uh, which, which makes sense because the landowner doesn't do anything, you know. Uh, some landowners may spot the fossil first and call you in. And then say, well, I found it. So maybe we could negotiate a higher percentage if they right. still want to press a fossil. That could make sense in some scenarios. What would, but, the, what would the split be for something like that on average? That's the lawsuit with Victoria. I don't want to, I don't know anything about the lawsuit. Uh, hold on. So, so somebody's trying to come in. I think it's, all right, but um, so we'll wrap, we'll wrap soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the the I, I don't know the specifics of the lawsuit. Uh, I met the landowners the other day who were in the lawsuit for Victoria, um, and uh, the the uh, I know that they're negotiating a much higher percentage than ten percent. It's it's in it's been written in articles before, so I'm not really divulging any information that isn't uh, already out there. But I don't know enough information to speak on the lawsuit, so right, I won't. That makes you know, sense. Um, but the point is, is that they are negotiating a higher percentage, and I'm not sure what the basis of that is. But the, you and the listeners are more than welcome, of course, to go and totally. uh, go and look for it. So. Last, um, last question for you: the sound that dinosaurs made, if they are relatives of birds, do you think that they made similar sounds back then, and they're not like these uh, sort of mammal? depicted sounds that we hear in the movies you know they probably yes had quite extensive vocalization that's kind of a debated thing right now in paleontology because you might think you might point to the conclusion that yes of course they made a wide variety of calls and sounds and stuff and roars and uh but we we haven't found the voice box that is um it's this one particular I'll just call it a voice box. I forgot the scientific name for it, but it hasn't, it's, it's found in birds. It's what gives birds their vocalization, but it hasn't been found fossilized in dinosaurs yet. So some people have hypothesized, well, what if they did, actually didn't make noises? And I'm, I'm very skeptical of that. And that, uh, in fact, I'm not sure if mammalian, that. oh, sorry. Is that they were mutes? Yeah, some people have hypothesized that or just done that they just did low rumbles for communication. Uh, for instance, uh, elephants do that today, where they do a low rumble, um, and it can actually travel as a tremor through the ground, and then elephants miles away will feel it, or kind of hear slash feel it, in a sense. And what they found in a T-Rex scan is that uh, T-Rex actually had very good hearing and very good eyesight. So a, a scan of the T-Rex's brain will show that the part of which is able to sense smell and I believe hearing uh, was greatly exaggerated, like was exaggerated in the sense where it was like lar enlarged in the, in the brain, meaning that it, it had good hearing right. and it could see very well. So the whole thing in the movies were don't move and he won't see you, that was utterly uh, nonsense because he would have definitely seen you. He would have had probably the best vision of any terrestrial animal to ever exist. So yeah, so T-Rex could spot you like four miles away, like 
Yeah. So think of the think of how good an eagle's like a bird's sight is. Right. You now enlarge in that optic the size of a softball, and that's how big of a T Rex's eye was, like is, the actual eye. How big was a T Rex brain compared to ours? So uh, the brain, I guess the the size was. Or, or, or is that does that have nothing to do with the brain, or is is so, that a portion in the brain? Well, I guess I, I guess when I say size of the brain, I mean like the 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 size of the olfactory portion of the brain compared to the rest of its size. So um, you could tell that it's part the part that enables you for for sensing sound is enlarged, and right. so is the part for smell. So you could tell that they had good smell and hearing and then from the size of their eyes they had good eyesight so the the point being with the sounds getting back to the sounds they had really good hearing so the, there's a good hypothesis that t-rex used the similar rumbles to communicate uh, uh just like elephants do so to us a t-rex doing that rumble would feel like a vibration and for other dinosaurs as well and they also think that was used to confuse them so they would be feeling this vibration. They wouldn't know what direction the T-Rex was coming from, which would have been really scary. So, <laughs> so the um, uh, so T-Rexes could have used that form of communication, but elephants use that form. But they're certainly not quiet. Elephants still make very loud noises. So uh, T-Rexes would have been uh, similar in that sense, where I think that dinosaurs would have had a a, a, a myriad of different noises and calls and clicks and rumbles and uh, you, you see the amount of noises that a bird makes like an ostrich will enlarge in its throat and like make that like low rumble noise and crocodilians do the same thing. I think dinosaurs made tons of different noises probably. That's so interesting. Yeah. Well, shoot, man, I could talk to you all day. You'll have to come back on. Hey, um, absolutely. I'd love to come back on. Where Where can people find you best? I know you're on TikTok. Where else are you? So, yeah, so uh, TikTok, Instagram uh, are both Duranosaur. So D-U-R-A-N-O-S-A-U-R. -O -O uh, those are both okay. my Instagram and uh, TikTok handles and uh, um and we're we've gotten kind of kind of semi TikTok famous in the last three months. I started TikTok like three months ago. I was making fun of it. And now I'm like a TikToker. It's like hilarious. But I love that. Yeah. yeah. So so we got uh, in the last three months we've gotten like six hundred and forty five thousand followers and that's amazing. Six point something million likes. Like it's it's been crazy. I'm Let's like, whoa, go. cool. So, yeah. So it's been it's been fun. Uh, but we're. I'm trying to, you know, uh, build up the the YouTube next. So the YouTube, you can find us at Fossil Excavators. I have tons of content that we filmed that I'm just in the editing process and ready to excited to get that long form content of fossil preparation and dinosaur excavation out there. So that's where you can find us, Fossil Excavators on YouTube. I love that, man. We'll keep crushing. We'll have to do this regularly. And uh, thanks so much again. Yeah. Hey, absolutely, man. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right. See everybody next time. Peace.